this is one of my favorite things in the, at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. These, this graphic and a matching graphic a few yards away were both done by one of my first bosses here at the museum, a wonderful scholar named Ed Leiser. Ed Leiser did sign this, but at the time, we didn't know it. That's his name up here, Ed Leiser. This doesn't appear on the original at all. You have to blow up the original to this big for, it to, for his name to pop out. So I watched Mr. Leiser do one of these two panels. After this long of a time, I just honestly can't remember which of the two he was working on the day I watched it. But he drew these like a computer printer prints a photograph. He started with an eight and a half by 11 sheet of typing paper in the middle of his desk. And over at this end, he put some tick marks, just a couple tick marks. And then in front of my eyes while he did it, a figure appeared out of the tick marks and he started working his way across the page. Over a period of months, without any pictures in front of him, he had a mental image. What would it be like if the top aces of World War I had actually met, regardless of what team they were on, if they were all standing in front of the same photographer? So with that as his starting point, and a single pen on a piece of paper, he started doing tick marks. Tick, 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 until the page filled in in front of him. It took a long time. He, he was meticulous. The man was more than anything in life, he was meticulous. He started at this end, worked his way across, and did a row of pilots. Then he did a second row of pilots behind them, and finally he added the airplane. These are the people that if you were reading a newspaper during the war years of 1914 to 1918, these are the names that would jump off the front page at you. Not only is it the people with the top scores, but it's also the people with the most outrageous conduct, the biggest bang for the newspaper's buck. So starting with the left, he put his, his favorite pilot. This is Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, a man that was instrumental in us to win two wars. Not only did he serve as an example in World War I, in World War II, when our first troops were hitting the invasion beaches in North Africa, word got back to the States that our troops on the troop transports were a little bit, uh, I'm not going to say afraid. They were expecting the worst when they faced the German uh, army. It, it didn't really go great for us at the beginning. So those people on the troop ships were thinking in their minds about the 18 countries that the German army had already steamrolled over. They approached him and he wrote a book, fabulous book. I, I really for a little pamphlet, it's one of my favorite books. It's called When a Man Faces Death. And with that little book in their pocket, our amphibious forces stormed ashore at Normandy, at Saipan, Iwo Jima, all those places. Our soldiers went into battle with a Bible in one pocket and his book in the other. It literally prepared them for what was gonna happen on those beaches. That's Captain Eddie. Across this board, each of these people made an impact like that. One of my favorite stories to talk about is this man, Ernst Udit. I consider him the best German pilot of World War I. Normally that credit goes to the Red Baron. The Red Baron was shot down twice in the war. This man got 64 victories without getting bullet holes in his plane. Ernst Udit also was famous in America. You might recognize this character, this kind of sad sack looking guy. Shoulders are rounded, hats crooked. At this stage of the war, most of his friends had been killed in combat. When he came to America, Hollywood saw him as a very tragic figure. They kind of liked this guy, except he was supposed to be the enemy. So when he showed up for the Long Beach Air Show and did a bunch of tricks and impressed everybody, after that big round of applause, Hollywood invited him to parties. And producers and writers started seeing this sad third kind of character. At the time, movies in Hollywood only had two roles, uh, arguably three, for a male. You could be the comic relief, we're gonna discard that. Otherwise, when you walked into central casting, they issued you a hat. You were either gonna be a white hat, that's the good guys, or a black hat if you were the villain. That's basically the three roles for men in early Hollywood. This guy shows up as a very sad figure, but, He's not a bad guy, even though at one time he was playing on the wrong team. Hollywood started including a new type of character in about 1930. 
particularly in aviation movies, and that character carries through to today, you might recognize the character of Han Solo saying, oh, I don't want to be the hero, I just want to take my cash and go. Oh, fine, I'll be the good guy. That character didn't exist before Ernst Udick came to Hollywood. The man beside him, the tallest man on the frame, is the only man on the entire frame that isn't in the correct height. Now this is a giant of a man in France. This is the top aviator of all time. This is Georges Guinemer. And you can go to just about any town in France, even today, and you'll find a street named after him. Rue de Guinemer is everywhere. Guinemer got 54 victories. He was also not near that tall. If my boss drew him accurately, he would have to draw a young man fighting polio most of his life. Many of the images of this man during the war years, he's leaning against a pole because he's unable to support his own weight. Often after a combat flight, his ground crew would have to lift him out by the shoulders and put him on his sticks and he'd walk off with a thank you. This man was an incredible aviator. 54 times he bested a German pilot in single combat. That's a man that fought Ernst Udit. What I consider the best German pilot and unquestionably the best French pilot. I urge anybody seeing this to look up that combat. For a half an hour they fought the classic rolling scissors duel over the battlefield. Down in the trenches below, they have very recognizable painting on their aircraft. The troops in the ground trenches know exactly who they're watching fighting above them as this classic half hour long dogfight takes place over their heads. In the end, Guinemer got into a perfect kill position, and when he was there, he, he had his enemy dead to rights, and as his finger closed on the trigger, he realized German pilot glanced back over his shoulder at him, accepting his fate, and in that second, this airman saw Ernst Udit had a small hammer in his hand, and it dawned on him. Through this rolling dogfight, the man's guns were jammed. He couldn't defend himself. <laughs> Guinemer rolled out beside him. And the two of them had words. They're yelling at each other, back here tomorrow, noon, be here. Well, history says they never met again, but on that day, the two best airmen of the, of the war met in the sky. So that's who's filling in these panels. He has to put von Schleich. You, you, you can find other pictures of von Schleich where he's not standing like this, but it's very, very tough. Throughout the 1914 to 1918 Great War, most of the images of this gentleman have him standing in front of everyone in that classic pose that only he could really carry. The last guy on here that I'd really like to talk about, Mr. Nungasir was my antidote to people suggesting that the French have no fighting spirit. One of the things working in the museum that I've heard a lot over the years is people make sometimes disparaging comments. And unfortunately, I know the backstory, so I, I can't help but step in and say, you know, this is my favorite case of that. Nungasir was struck in the face by an exploding bullet. He lost an eye. His cheek was blown out. It didn't stop him. This man crawled out the window of the hospital, took a car and went back to his squadron. He was so angry at being shot down. He had almost as many victories as Guinemer. He survived the war. He was a French hero that everyone knew. Even in America, people knew his name. He was one of the gentlemen that made it a goal of being the first solo across the Atlantic. He came up with a plane called the White Gull. It was one of the very first airplanes with detachable landing gear. After he took off, it's like, I'm not gonna need that anymore. I'm flying 3,000 miles across the ocean. So he jettisoned the landing gear and he took off across the Atlantic. On the other side of the Atlantic, all of America was waiting. We had celebrations planned. We expected him to make it. And on the night that he was supposed to arrive, all up and down the eastern seaboard, people standing outside were phoning in saying, I've heard a plane pass over. He never landed. We don't have any idea where he came to earth. So on that night, when this man lost his life in the attempt, Lindbergh told the assembled people around him, I have to go. If I don't try across, and I know I will make it, I know my aircraft is capable, more men will die in the attempt. He goes, I can't have that on my conscience because I know I can make it. So quite literally, the reason Lindbergh crossed the ocean when he did 
is because this friend of his had fallen in the attempt. I'm standing in front, in front of part of our World War I display, and in this case, it shows the different styles of insignia that the aircraft wore on their sides back then. You really need to know in combat which side the other planes are on. So very quickly after combat in the air began, nations started putting identifying insignia on them. I tell everybody that comes to the museum that the Germans got to pick first, so they put targets on all the airplanes of the Allies, while anybody on Germany's team got the black and white of the traditional black hat. So this is Ed Leiser's second panel, and he started this one with the arguably the best pilot of the war. This is the Red Baron. All the people on here fall into the same category as the other display, the other uh, graphic. Uh, these are people that would jump off the front page. There's a couple people on here you wouldn't expect, and some people that I think definitely earn their spot here. Even if they don't have the top number of victories in the air, their stories are enough that it's an exciting thing to include. Beside the Red Baron, we have this man that Ed Leiser put at an angle and off to the side. He's not giving him a lot of respect. This is the Red Baron's replacement as commander of the famed Flying Circus. This is the World War II true anti-hero, Hermann Goering. Beside him, this is America's first fighter pilot. This is the first maverick in American history. When Raoul Lefebvre went to France to join the, the, the French fighting forces fighting against Germany, he joined the famous Lafayette Escadrille. And that unit uh, was made up of not just Americans, but volunteers from a couple different nations. But he's the first American to come. And when he came, he wanted to show everybody truly that he was an American. So when he showed up, he came with uh, six guns, like a cowboy, and he came with two lion cubs, whiskey and soda. One of the things he did in life that I always really thought was interesting was, he's the only person I know that took his fighter airplane and painted out the national insignia, that, that big target that we talked about. He painted it out on his aircraft and replaced it with his own initials, RL. The museum's Newport 11 has been repainted to match the colors of the fighter plane he flew in combat. And you'll notice very proudly on the side of the airplane, there is, are his initials, RL. The other personalities on this board, all of them made a significant dent in the enemy. Mr. Emmelman was such a fantastic fighter pilot. Fighter pilots today use one of their standard maneuvers and they call it the, the Emmelman. Beside him is a person we don't talk about a lot. Uh, this gentleman, uh, in aviation, when somebody has a nice round number of victories and claims, typically that's a little bit of a question. In this man's autobiography, his best friend wrote the foreword in which he said, this is not a liked man. He's not easy to like. Rene Funk put in 125 victory claims during the war. And while he most definitely got a lot of victories. Even today, he's credited with 75, one of those nice round numbers in aviation that we always kind of scratch our beards at. The man beside him, I grew up in Arizona next to an Air Force base called Luke Air Force Base. Luke Air Force Base is named after an American Indian that grew up out in the desert right where I came from. He wanted to prove himself as a warrior, so he signed up for World War I and went to become a fighter pilot over in France. There he shot down, he destroyed 18 aircraft and observation balloons in the sky. The truly incredible thing about this feat is he did all of that in less than 10 days. That was the entire amount of time he was in combat. So when I grew up, Luke Air Force Base was a part of my background. I was it was a place I used to go as a kid to watch airplanes take off. Beside him is Mick Manick, famous for being an exceptional fighter pilot, but with only one eye. That's so difficult. You have no depth perception. Your enemy does. Your enemy is, in most cases, going to have incredible eyesight. It's one of the prerequisites to be a, a truly good flyer. This man did it all with half the vision of most of his com comrades. Beside him, a really fun story from the war. 
most people that fly through accident or some kind of conduct, they earn a call sign. This man's name is Barking Mad Barker. He was, uh, he was a handful. I would not have wanted to be his commanding officer. What he's most famous for, besides being an outstanding fighter pilot, he never had a pilot lesson. When he showed up the first day, he'd already been in combat in the trenches. He had ribbons. When he showed up, people thought he was a pilot. They assigned him a plane. Not willing to look like a fool, he followed the lead of the other people, and he managed to take off successfully, land successfully, and when the flabbergasted instructors realized this man had never had a lesson, there was not much they could do except say, here's your airplane. He was extremely successful during the war, and I think he really typifies the fighting spirit of most of the people that my boss decided to put on these panels.